everybody. Um, thanks for joining me today. Oh, that was loud. I'm sorry. Thanks for joining me today. Um, hi, my name is Emma Stewart. I'm a chief power grid scientist at Idaho National Laboratory. Um, I've spent about the last 20 years working on power grid nerd stuff effectively. Um, I've done everything from uh, essentially working on poles and wires about 20 something years ago up to now where I like to be called doctor and it's kind of cool, but um, I uh, do all sorts of things. I've worked as a chief scientist for 900 utilities. I, um, I built a, a cyber program for um, a lot of the small rural co-ops in the country. But um, the last few years I've been working mostly on renewable security and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So just very briefly, um, I'll start here. We are in the middle of various different crises. Um, essentially, the climate has been changing, and in the last few years, we've had, I believe, a, a number of now $10 billion weather events that are causing all sorts of havoc around the country, um, especially in our power grid in particular, because things fall down in weather. As much as everyone wants to think cyber is probably the worst problem we have, it's not, it's weather. It knocks things down far more often than any of you do. So, <laughs> yeah. That's the world. Um, but, you know, this isn't great. We, we do need to change this. The energy sector essentially provides about 28% of emissions into our, into our atmosphere. That's helping with this climate change problem. So we're trying to change that by installing lots and lots of renewable energy and transitioning to this more clean, digital, affordable system also. But just, I am a power grid person. So in all of these talks, I give a what is the power grid to everyone. If you come to one of my power grid talks at a power conference, you won't hear this part. Um, but how does the system work and how has it worked? We've essentially for a very long time had power that flows from large spinning generators around the country um, all the way down through our large power lines down to the small customers, uh, sub-transmission, primary customers, your houses. That's been the way it's been for a very long time since the beginning of all power grid time it has looked this way. And that's changing. We have massive amounts of things happening to do with energy storage, which is the primary focus of this discussion today. Um, we have electric vehicles plugging in everywhere. We also have things like the cloud. Um, a lot of the small utilities are trying to modernize at the moment and their only option for modernization is actually using cloud-based applications in lots of places. They can't install data centers in tiny utilities. I will say I've seen the convergence of these things recently. I was working with a small utility and uh, they had had a massive tornado come through that took out one of their operations center and their data center was effectively Dorothy'd into a river. So they, uh, there's a lot happening together in the power grid and uh, things there are there. So. But what does energy transition mean to me um, and to a lot of people? I said big spinning machines, as in these big rotating generators that are there. Um, they've been there forever. They're very reliable. They've been around a long time. Big spinning metal, effectively. Um, they've been traditionally manufactured around the country, and most of that has a, a decent sized US base for manufacture. Um, I'll use the spoiler alert here. As we transition to things like solar storage, lots of distributed systems, um, it's going to be massive distributed connected solid state devices all over the place with lots of numbers of them. Where there was one big generator, there now might be 10,000 smaller devices connected together, providing power to our grid. And the spoiler alert is with largely Chinese manufacturers. So most of this is manufactured in China. And that's why I'm talking today. But if you like the lights been on today, um, this is just what this means to you in the room. Uh, the MGM is the biggest solar rooftop in the world at the moment. Um, if you can see on top of the MGM, that's apparently the largest owner of solar in this area on a rooftop. It's, it's kind of amazing, actually, when you look at the rooftops of Vegas, you start to see this solar stuff everywhere. Um, the energy storage is actually wildly useful just now for us, um, both Texas and California have had major events that required them to ramp up fast generators to provide power really quickly. Um, both of them, I think it's been around 17 emergency dispatches of storage, um, storage generation in California, I believe, in the last couple of years, meaning a grid operator is sitting there going, we need power really fast, asking them to do an immediate control action to discharge all of their power. Um, that's kind of a big deal. It's an immediate action that needs to be taken to stop the lights going off. So the energy storage has been doing it. That picture on the right was in Texas, I believe, uh, January this year, when a gigawatt of batteries ramped up to sort of save the day. Um, and that was a, a good thing. But um, current state of supply, this is a weird graph. But last year after this conference, um, I was out 
another renewable energy conference in the same place. It's the biggest renewable energy conference, I believe, in the world. Um, I've worked in renewable energy for a long time and sort of watched the change of the supply chain here. Me and one of my other cyber colleagues, there was only about three of us there, were walking around the, the shop floor, um, the expo floor as you do, trying to look at all the gear and realized that almost everything we were looking at was a Chinese company. It, was, it wasn't um, hidden, it wasn't covert, it wasn't a mysterious component we were finding in a device and critical infrastructure. It was straight up people that are, everyone is from China, essentially was at this conference. And it was kind of a moment of change where before I would have said, we need, we've got US manufacturer, we're building this. And I was kind of looking at it like, ah, I'm not sure we do and we're not hiding it. So this is a big challenge. And that was the, I used this example here of, um, this was what the conference expo floor looked like. Orange is everything is from China. Um, and every other color is, is anywhere else. I think green I'd put in was Germany and blue is the US manufacturer as well. So about 95 to 100% of our digital components available right now have a, a Chinese made, owned or derived control or software component in it as well. So that is where we're at. But um, another sort of supply chain event that happened has been my life for the past two years actually. Um, in April, 2023, um, a large military base uh, announced they were installing and uh, I think commissioning, the picture on the bottom left is that one, commissioning their giant new battery um, on Camp Lejeune. And uh, basically they took a nice picture with the command cutting the ribbon with cattle written behind their head, which is a large, one of the largest battery manufacturers in the world who is a Chinese company. And so given the defense posture that we look at from um, components that we're using, this was definitely a moment of us all looking at the TV going, ah, why'd you take that selfie? Come on. So everyone sort of started to catch on that this was where we were at. Again, this led to a series of events that have been the rest of my life, um, which was dealing with there being um, various, like we're, we're seeing that Chinese hackers are preparing to attach our, attack our infrastructure. That is known. Um, following that, about a year later, uh, this was in December, the, the large utility announced that they were disconnecting that battery that had been put on Camp Lejeune, um, that, citing there was security concerns with it, okay. But uh, this led to about 10 or 20 utilities in the country starting to call and say, wait, don't we, we have those as well? Um, are we meant to do something? And we're like, ah. Okay, can, I was like, first of all, can I get that battery for a minute? And then second, they were like, everyone was just panicking at this point that both their boards were yelling at them and they were concerned from a security perspective and asking for resources for how are they gonna, how are they going to secure this because they can't get rid of it. They, they can't afford to ditch their $10 million investment and just buy something else. And even then there wasn't anything else for them to buy. So a lot of people were calling and panicking and various things going on. Then uh, we'll say we move on to now. Um, I believe the largest solar plus storage project in the world came online um, about a couple months ago. It is connected to another military base also. When they announced this, they were saying, great, we've got our new batteries here. And then it was another one of the, the battery companies that's listed just now on the banned battery list on the National Defense Authorization Act. They announced it in the news though. So every time I read one of these news stories, I'm like, but there's a list and it's written and we're okay. And then they announce it on the news and more calls start. So that's been my life. Um, the other thing that happened uh, a few years ago, we obviously banned Huawei. Um, that was a big deal. We, they exited the market for various things of equipment. Um, and about, I think four days ago, uh, Pentagon officials were announcing that they would like a, a waiver from the Huawei ban now because they can't get rid of the equipment. So if the Pentagon's asking for the waiver, Rip and replace probably hasn't worked that well for Huawei. So going the same approach with the batteries is essentially the, the policy topic of, of my, my talk. So how did we get here? Why did we end up this way? Um, if you read any news stories, they, they try and blame whoever is in, in leadership right now. It's always the, the latest leader's problem that this has happened. But we started this probably 10 or 12 years ago. Um, we prioritized low cost and volume for solar storage and renewable energy. It's great, we needed cheaper products for this to actually happen because we do need renewable energy. That's the, the sort of theme here is we need this to happen, but how we got there, we prioritized low cost. That meant we shift a lot of this offshore. That's just how it happens. We started to manufacture it in China. 
And then we, we did get that low cost. We reached a dollar a watt in 2015, I believe, and then it's gone down from there. But now we're at this point, we just don't really build a lot of this in the US. We might soon, um, but uh, investors need a demand signal. If we said we're gonna get rid of all the batteries and we're not gonna do this anymore, the investors aren't going to invest in new batteries being built here for another five years, so what will we do in the interim? I, I used this picture on the right, it was from Bloomberg um, a few, about four years ago. Um, it was actually, again, I love to use media stories as being funny, but uh, it said basically, the US is number two in the world on battery manufacture. So they are not that big line, so we're clear. We are not the, the large line, that, that was China. Um, so we are number two, but we also lost by about eight laps of this. So we've got a lot of making up to do if we want to be competing in here. Just some quick facts and figures, quickly. Um, Huawei is still the number one inverter or um, power conversion manufacturer in the world. Um, when they exited the market from the US, they went from number two to number one in the world somehow. Um, so that didn't necessarily work. Um, what makes it different? Volume and regulation. Um, there's about 73 named inverter manufacturers. So when I said we have um, large spinning generators, those are generally made by probably about three or four companies at this point. When we look at inverters and more particularly look at vulnerability analysis of inverters, you've got 73 companies and about 1,500 different models to look at that we haven't done that type of analysis on yet. And that's just now. Um, if you look at battery vendors as well, we're in the same place. Um, there's integrators of these equipment. A lot of the equipment is actually the same hardware, different label. Um, still, we need to do a lot of that analysis. But the, the, the hardware is often similar. Um, and then we also have features like remote communication and access is necessary, because if you have lots and lots and lots of devices, you kind of need them to get updated as well with all those nice patches that we need all the time. So remote comms is a big deal. But what are some common challenges we have um, in renewable control systems in particular? They, they work pretty well just now, but again, inverters and power electronics, we see spinning generators last 40, 50 years. They're mostly older than all of us. Um, well, some of us, not looking at anyone else, but uh, they're mostly older than all of us, but inverters tend to fail about every 15 years. So we actually have opportunity to get rid of them and get new ones eventually, but they do fail about every 15 years. Um, things that cause challenges with them, failing chips. We have chipsets that just don't work very well in lots of cheap systems. Persistent communications. We have to communicate with these devices for them to work, but that's obviously a threat or a risk. Um, Hard-coded passwords are freaking everywhere, like <laughs> absolutely everywhere. And we can't, I'll talk why, but we can't do a ton about that right now. Um, operations and maintenance is a fourth party person that will come in and do things. There's white labeled products, um, insecure applications. Some of the primary vulnerabil vulnerabilities we've had in these devices have been app based. It's the cool little app you use to log on to your solar power. Most of them are kind of junk, so here we are. Um, there's not really any software bill of materials that comes with these things, and even if it did, we probably wouldn't trust it at this point. Um, and again, there's really no vulnerability disclosure for the devices that are not made either in the US or Germany. We just don't have it because they're made in China. So what's more common in the Chinese manufactured products? Um, in particular, apart from the white, well, the white label products are not necessarily there, but these are things that are very, very common in the products that we're seeing being imported as well. And that's, that's a challenge. The, there's, these things are difficult to fix as well because a lot of those vulnerabilities, even if we find them, who's gonna fix them? So we're kind of in this interesting point. Um, the hard-coded password thing has been coming up a lot. Um, it's something we really need to fix. But you know, the models are a big challenge. We like to say there's, there have been no events on renewable energy infrastructure that have caused the power to go out. So we're, there have been no cyber events that have caused a power outage. There have been events that have caused a communications outage or denial of service on communications or loss of visibility. There's also been a number of ransomware events um, starting all the way back in 2014. Um, there's been a number of sort of ransomware, uh, different wind turbine events also. Um, again, ransomware is bad, but it's not necessarily turned the power off. It, nobody hit the big red button. Um, some of the more interesting ones in the US, there was a company um, that had a denial of service attack in 2019. They're in Utah, um, very, very large um, manufacturer, or sort of very large owner of wind power. 
They had a denial of service attack that essentially took down comms. They couldn't see it. Um, when you lose comms to renewable energy, most things will stay online. They won't necessarily fail. But over time, they will start to fail, so you do still need to get that back. But these, these things are happening. We do have challenges. So, But some key points from a policy perspective, we've put a lot of responsibility for securing these devices on the average consumer. So if you have an inverter or solar installation in your house or battery installation, generally you're the consumer and you're the one responsible for updating this system. We're also putting them everywhere. Um, the example here, we are putting them on lots of low income and disadvantaged community locations, multifamily housing. Um, that's a challenge. Who's going to update that? Who's in charge of it? Who's doing that? We're saying this is to help people with their energy bills, but we're also then giving them products that potentially have security vulnerabilities that cause them more challenges. But we put the responsibility on the consumer. Um, whether these devices have one or 92 vulnerabilities in them, the person that's updating it is the person standing beside it that owns it, not necessarily the company connecting to it, but they're responsible for securing these devices because when there was a, a Enphase had a pretty um, bad vulnerability that came out and in the instructions of how to fix it, it was essentially the consumers need to go and do something and reboot it. So it was a very long list of things that we were expecting, say, Joe down the road to do. No offense, Joe's in the room. There's like 14 of them. So, um, But we're expecting someone down the road to go and fix all of that and reading the analysis that came out. I was like, eh, I'm not sure anyone's going to touch that. I think that's just going to go and everyone's going to leave it alone. So, but. Well, I talked a lot about sort of what the IT level attacks look like, but the industrial control system landscape for a supply chain style attack looks a lot more like what happened with solar winds. I made these slides before CrowdStrike, so we're clear, but it looks a lot, a lot like what happened uh, with solar winds. Like pushing out mass firmware to these devices is actually a pretty useful feature. I mentioned the, the customer's responsible. Pushing it out to millions of devices is actually pretty useful. It's had problems. Um, there was a mass push out to an island of a lot of uh, inverters that came out. They pushed a firmware device out and everything stopped working for a minute. That wasn't great. Um, but software events have happened. Um, when there was an event in California recently, the batteries weren't working properly during a heat event effectively. Um, one of the things they did to fix it was a hot software fix where they pushed out a new software to the device immediately and got it to start responding properly and start working again. Great, but you know, that is also a potential vector for problems to come as we all now know. But like I said, technically what makes them a risk is a benefit. Um, the other issue on our battery and inverter supply chain is that the batteries are actually getting better over time. Um, so we don't really make them here, like I've said. But they're, they're getting better. That's the, the problem. If we look at quality of the batteries over time, if we look at the fires that have happened, they're pretty well published. That There's a number of fires, um, thermal runaways, when batteries just go out of control on fire, essentially it's an electrochemical reaction. Um, there's been less if we look at all the data that's been collected. I think it's since 2018 that's decreased drastically, actually. Um, partially that's because, and there's been some news on this recently, uh, Chinese companies have put lots and lots of money into improving the quality of their products. Um, people are being educated in doing that. They also collect data from all of these. We like to say that like, you shouldn't be communicating with that, but they do collect data from all of the, the devices and look at the quality over time. And what that actually means is there's a secondary communication device for one, but also that they are improving their product. So. If we were actually looking to get rid of these batteries entirely, the only thing that's really going to happen is these companies will go to a cheaper battery manufacturer that's, or somebody else that's not on this list and end up potentially with more fires because they're not put as much money into it. So we're kind of in this catch-22 just now of damned if we do, damned if we don't, one way or the other, and that was that's today. So, so what? Who cares? We are dependent on these. Um, there's some bad, bad. There's bad bad communications, hard-coded password, hard -coded passwords, and sort of questionable software used to update things. Um, there's an over-concentration of Chinese products. Um, it's a global issue. Um, I don't necessarily think if anyone was targeting one particular supply chain, it would just affect this country. It would affect many countries because those products are global at this point. And we have 
fairly minimal control over the supply chain. Even if we do actually ban a number of products, it's not necessarily, you can't necessarily tell private industry, you will never buy this. That didn't work with some of the other products. So we don't necessarily have a ton of control over what people buy because we do have a free market here. So uh, we've got minimal control over that really. Again, I'm a failure mode person. I've done a lot of work on setting things on fire. So I have to talk about that for a minute. Um, what would actually happen if there were a major attack on a battery? Well, I mentioned loss of visibility. Um, this is the, the first thing that's probably the easiest and has happened. So essentially, if I was looking at difficulty, loss of communication and loss of visibility is kind of the, the biggest, easiest thing that can happen. Again, that's when they lose status monitoring or physical access alarms, which can be a bigger challenge. Like I said, there have been examples of this happening. The attack against the, the Viasat network um, during the Ukra Ukraine invasion in East, uh, Northern Europe actually resulted in the loss of about 6,000 wind turbines communication, which, you know, okay, they've lost comms, but they actually had to go out and fix each one of these individually in the end. So uh, that was quite a big device problem, actually. Um, other types of potential attacks, if you look at a site I mentioned fire, they are an electrochemical device, they do get hot, please don't open them up to take a look at that. Um, they might lose their preventive or proactive disconnect, potentially they stay online when you're trying to take them offline. There could be damage to site capacity and environmental discharge. These things burn, if anyone was around here recently or tried to drive from California to LA, um, sorry, LA to Las Vegas, there was a huge lithium ion battery fire in the middle of this that shut down the road and the, the plume from that was terrible. So chemicals are bad. Lastly, the most difficult style of these things is electric grid impact. It's the one we talk about most, but it's probably the most difficult. Again, to actually coordinate a massive event where the lights would go out everywhere, it would take a lot. Um, it would take a lot of coordination with more expensive power electronics than we actually have for one, which is good. But it's still a challenge. Um, we can't have these things misbehaving over the system. It's a bit of a problem. Okay, this is a policy talk though. So what, how do we fix it? There are technical solutions. I'm not talking about those today. I'm mostly talking about from a policy standpoint, what we really need to do to help fix these problems. I came up with four options of the direction we're going and the direction I think we should go. Um, but so I was gonna talk about that a little bit. Well, option one and option two are really ban the companies, rip and replace. I mentioned before we've tried this, we are going down this path. We've already started the process. There's been 10 companies that have been banned in the latest National Defense Authorization Act. That's gonna increase, we're looking at more and more. Fair enough, that's the direction we're going, but it doesn't mean we're gonna have a solution that works there because people might just go buy another cheaper one from the 70 list, so it might just get worse. But um, second option we're really looking at, rip and replace, that's came up. What does that mean? Um, around a couple, maybe three, four years ago, when they banned Huawei from our networks. Um, they also put funding in place for um, a bunch of small utilities to actually go replace all their Huawei equipment. It was an order that came through and then they put said, well, we're gonna put $4 billion towards small utilities taking out this equipment, buying new equipment, not buying Huawei. That was great, except we underfunded it by $3 billion. So we ended up with, I believe a couple months ago, $1 billion is spent out on doing this. Most of the utilities have not been able to actually replace the Huawei equipment because they can't buy it and the funding isn't there for them to do it. So that didn't work. The other part is uh, when we banned Huawei, they just went from being number two to number one in the world. That was the strangest part of this is when uh, we banned them and they exited the market in 2019 in the US. In 2022, they were the top one, number one and globally of inverter shipments in the world. So again, rip and replace is not really, or even banning them is not necessarily the best beginning. What about now? Again, if I did the math on how many, what we actually need to do to replace all the batteries in the system, at least in one state, it would be around $4 billion. So look at previous number for what we didn't fund the first time. I believe, I think in the US, I did the math, it was around $15 billion in the US to replace what we have currently installed or in line. So I don't think that's gonna happen. I don't know who's gonna push that bill, but it's not gonna. There's about 70 options as it are 80 now. Um, again, they pop up from launched integration in about one year. It's just material. Um, we'll end up playing whack-a-mole just forever. If you keep banning one, the next one will come up. We'll have to ban them. We'll just keep going until we have a really confused supply chain and no one knows who to buy it from. It'll also stop what we're doing currently. 
we will not be able to transition the grid if we keep doing going down this path. They do have a fire issue, like I said, but the ones that have caused more of the fires have not actually been on the ban list. Um, so despite the fact they've had an actual physical impact of a piece of device or a, a fire, um, they're just not on a ban list yet for some reason. So we're kind of stuck in these two worlds. Again, I try not to be super negative, um, but there is progress, there is investment in the country. The Chips for America Act is bringing in a lot of the manufacture of chips, which will help solve some of our power electronics problems in a few years, probably not right now. Um, also, there is investment in battery cell material being built, um, which is all over the country. But again, we, we have five to 10 years before that's a reality. So we have to keep going, and that's not necessarily gonna work. We also, again, still need the demand signal. The other problem we have is actually inspecting the equipment. Um, there's a lot of vulnerability analysis programs, that's great. But if I look at the list of the inverters that have been analyzed, most of them aren't uh, really reported through um, any US entity. We aren't necessarily saying that this is on the vulnerability list, here's what you need to fix. It's something from a policy perspective I would love to see change. I believe that when we bring in products to this country to use on our critical infrastructure, we should be able to analyze it, we should be able to look inside it, and we should be able to push that out to, for other people to fix. It's a, a contract teeth issue that we kind of need at the moment. Um, and I think I believe it needs to be pushed from the national level so people can actually change their contracts so we can start doing this kind of work. But it's a huge challenge. We have the technology and we have the capability. We could keep these inverters and just analyze them, but we need to actually push back on the rules that we have in place for us not really looking at these devices or reporting it. Just, it'd be a deterrence. It'd be really good to actually say we're gonna analyze this equipment and we're gonna report vulnerabilities, um, but there's a trade-off there also, and I'm speeding up because I'm probably running out of time. Um, but it, like I said, we have had analysis done on many of the common products, and that's, that's happening. We need this for all of them, though. If we're going to use all of these devices, we need the ability to analyze what's inside them and keep doing that. Just on the last part, um, we need to have better contract requirements for people. Again, this policy talk, but contracts are one of our bigger problems. Um, people write contracts that don't necessarily put into their, we're gonna look at your equipment, or we need to have particular TMZs for your firmware. We don't put in monitoring. We have to fix our contracting. But just lastly, the last one that keeps coming up is regulation. Um, we're saying, oh, we're gonna regulate clean energy security. These companies will be under NERCSIP, uh, which is the critical infrastructure protection rules in this country. I'm not sure who we're gonna regulate. So just in the, the last piece, or who is going to regulate them? Um, I, there's one site I was looking at that had one developer and owner, they sold those site rights to somebody else um, I, who are finance bros. Sorry, that's my running joke that they keep selling these sites to finance bro companies, which isn't necessarily the greatest idea when they own a gigawatt of generation. I don't know how many of them you want in charge of a gigawatt of generation, so we're clear. Um, that site was developed. That owner then sold that again to another French company. So now we have a site that owns a gigawatt of generation in one state that is owned by a French company. Um, okay, fair enough. It's physically connected to our grid though, so there's a utility over here that has the electrons flowing to it. Um, and then there's the components that are manufactured in China. There's the third party operations and maintenance that's somewhere else. And then there's this fourth party operator somewhere over here doing something else, which is weird. And then they, they bid into the market. This one was in Texas, but they, they're still bidding into the market. So they have this connection to this, the, the operator for the state also. So I've been trying to work out for a while, like which, which person is the regulated one? Who's registering as the generator here? Who's the one that follows the rules? I'm not sure which one it is at this point. So we need to work that out if we're gonna do anything from enforcing different things. I'll leave this up here. It was my last slide, but we will not have time to cover it. Um, a while ago, we did run an exercise on the case I just said, but running an exercise of what if we essentially did an emergency mass push of firmware to millions of inverter devices at the same time and brick them all with a lot of people in the room trying to, not that that ever happens, um, but we uh, ran this exercise trying to get some good answers from all of those people that have ownership to work out whose problem this really would be. And it was one of the more confusing things we've ever had to do because everyone was just kind of staring at me with a, that doesn't seem good, just that's not good. I was like, okay, great. So won't have time to cover it, but these are the sort of questions we were asking and things we were thinking about here on what if we did um, 
we called it the sun splat exercise, which I'm still pretty proud of. But it was uh, essentially, if what if we happened to mass push things and break everything and who would fix it? With the idea that someone would actually have to manually go fix millions of devices at the same time. Again, that never happens. Cool. Well, that's my summary, but again, we need to do this. We're stuck between two worlds, but we have to get renewable energy and clean energy out there. It's just a fact. We do not want to keep going with climate change the way it is. We've got to fix this. It's, it's a thing. Whether you believe in it or not, this is one of the solutions that should be happening and is going to happen. We do have adversarial entities in the supply chain. We need to somehow fix that also, but we have technology solutions that we can do. We just need a number of policy changes for us to be able to do the technology pieces that we have. Um, we can fix it, but you know we've got to actually do the things and actually start doing the installations the right way and do the connections the right way for future. But that's my, uh, that's my summary for today. Um, thank you for, for listening. And if there are any questions, I don't know if I have time, but I can answer at the end as well. So. <laughs>